Hello, this is Dan with Orbital Guitars, and this is going to be the video on how I made the Wyvern. So I'm going to start by preparing some material for the neck. It's going to be a three-piece neck with flame maple and wenge. I'll start by ripping flame maple into two pieces of equal width. And next I'm going to rip a piece of wenge to that same width. Once those pieces are cut, I can get them glued up and ready to be made into the neck. Now these may seem uh, especially wide pieces. Um, I cut these uh, this width specifically so that I could hopefully get two full neck through blanks out of this one glued up board. So after the glue is dry, I'm going to take this back to the table saw and rip the two edges uh, perfectly square. Next I'm going to start preparing the, the uh, piece of bog oak, and as you can see it's a little bit twisted on that side and on that side. So I'm going to have to do something about that. So what I'm doing here is I'm putting a couple of wedges underneath the board so that it's not rocking anymore. Uh, went a little bit uh, overboard, didn't quite need to go this far, some screws probably would have done it, but gluing on some blocks at either end so that the board can't move. And so it's on top of this, this flat piece of plywood so that it, it can't wobble or move while it's running through the planer. As you can see, this side is now straight. And this side is not. Luckily I don't have to mess with the plywood board anymore because with one side being straight I can have that side facing down as I run it through the planer some more to get the other side straightened. And as you can see, that side is now flat. And so is that side. Except for that one corner, but that corner is not really something that I'm worried about. Now, I intended this piece of bog oak to be essentially the entire body. Unfortunately, it's not big enough for that, uh, nor is it thick enough. So what I'm doing here is splitting it down the middle so that I can sandwich a piece of maple in between so that uh, both the front and the back of the body can be bog oak. Nice, the table saw blade didn't quite get all the way through. So I have to resort to finishing it off by hand. Now some people may wonder, why didn't I just rip this down with a bandsaw? Well, at this point while I was working, my bandsaw was, um, to put it simply, broken. And of course just coming in with a small hand plane to clean up the uh, little excess wood in the middle there. And then gluing in the piece of maple. Um, this was not flame maple, just regular maple. Flame maple might have been a nice touch to see around the outside edges, but I mean to me that would have felt like kind of a waste of flame maple to have it glued into the middle of a body where you can barely see it. Now just to add a little bit of flair, uh, I decided to take a couple strips of veneer. You can see here one was black walnut and the other is this pale moon ebony. And I'm going to glue those onto one edge of this blank here for the wings. So now going back to the neck, I'm preparing to route the channel for the truss rod. I'm going to start by drilling a hole at each end, 
uh, so that I know where the ends of the truss rod are going to be. And then I just route from one to the other using this guide fence on the edge of the board. And this is why I went out of my way to make sure that this neck blank was square before I started, so that I could just use that rip fence rather than needing any sort of template. And then just going in with a small chisel and squaring up the ends. And of course widening this, this top ends because the, uh, the nut of the truss rod is a little bit wider than the rest of the truss rod. Now that that's done, I can begin cutting out the neck blank itself. As you can kind of see on the side there, I've marked out two full neck blanks on this piece of wood. And of course, I mentioned earlier my bandsaw was broken. This was the new bandsaw I got to replace it. Good thing I did. I didn't want to do this cut by hand. Here I'm drilling for truss rod access from the headstock. I'm going to start by drilling straight in and then slowly angling the drill until it's going straight into the end of the truss rod channel. Also switching to a longer drill bit. Now I'm preparing the fretboard. You can see on the screen there this is Chechen. It's also flamed. Came out quite nicely when this was done. So now that the fretboard is roughly cut, I'm going to put in the truss rod, put a piece of tape over it so that the glue doesn't get into that channel. I did this a little bit differently than usual. I ended up removing the tape before I put the fretboard on because I felt like the tape was making the glue up a little bit more difficult than it needed to be on some of my previous builds. And then just going in with the Dremel to widen out the truss rod access, make it easier to get the wrench in there. Just testing to make sure it reaches, and it does. Now I'm just trimming down the excess material from the fretboard. Um, so those who are familiar with this sort of thing might have noticed I haven't cut the uh, profile of the neck yet. Uh, I mean, just just the uh, taper. Um, so there's a reason for that. It's so that the, the entire neck is still square on both sides right now. It's not tapered yet. Which means when I place these marks for uh, place these marks for the fret slots, they're going to be uh, the appropriate distance from each other. Now, if I'd done this when it was tapered, they would all end up being slightly closer together. And some people have complained on my other videos when I do this after the neck is tapered, saying, "Well, you're screwing up, you're screwing up the whole thing. The uh, the intonation is going to be wrong." and you have to realize, even if I do this after the neck is tapered, I measure where to put the bridge after the frets are in there, so that the intonation is going to work. I don't just go, okay, the bridge is supposed to be this far, and then just put it there. I measure before I put the bridge there. It's fine. Anyway, um, here I got a little bit ahead of myself by gluing on the template. Um, before cutting down the edges. A uh, little bit risky to cut with the template on there because it might have damaged the template, but being appropriately careful, you can get away with it if you need to. Um, and then going back to my router table and getting that taper routed into its final shape. Of course, this is the added complication of 
doing everything with the neck still square to begin with, there's this excess material at the end of the fretboard that needs to be removed. I removed most of it with the saw, and then just cleaning up the last of it with a chisel. Okay, so now I'm going back to working on the wings a little bit. Need to cut them out of this blank. And this really was kind of the bare minimum piece of bog oak that I could actually get away with making this body. It's just barely big enough for these wings. And here, cutting a little piece off of... Uh, well, cutting out a little piece from one of the cutoffs. There is a reason for this. Because the headstock it would not quite be wide enough. So by putting on an excess piece from one of the wings, I'm making the headstock match the rest of the body. In that, when you see the front of the body, you see bog oak, um, pale moon ebony, walnut, flame maple, wenge, flame maple, you know, and it continues on the rest of the way across. Now the headstock matches that. I'm cutting out the shape of the headstock on the bandsaw, and then, then going over to the spindle, sa spindle sander to even it out. So next up I'm moving on to cutting the fret slots. You can see that I just make a small cut at either end of the fret slot, and then make them meet across the middle. That's not the way that you have to do it, it's just the way that I like to do it. Alright, so now that those have been cut, I'm going to begin carving in the profile of the neck. I've described this process in detail before, and other channels on YouTube have described it as well. It's that I've laid out a series of facets that I carve, and then gradually smaller and smaller facets until you've got a rounded neck, and then smooth it off with a random orbital sander. Now because this is neck through, um, normally if I had a neck pocket I could drill a channel between the two pickup pockets so that the wires could get through, but since that's not an option this time, I'm going to route a channel into the side of the neck blank. And this is what's going to allow me to run the wires through. Then I begin radiusing the fretboard, just using a small radius block. And just to get a look at that really nice fretboard wood. I'm going to begin working on the inlay, laying this out on the 12th fret. And just for reference, I make sure that the wings of the bird are on the 12th fret. Then I'm going to use my uh, precision, precision router base with my Dremel and remove most of the material. Alright, you're using a 3 30 seconds uh, router bit. Just to get the bulk of the material out of the way. After that, I switch to a 3 30 seconds router bit to uh, make the details a little bit finer in there. And of course, going in to clean up the corners with a knife and some chisels to get those nicely squared up. So, this inlay, I'm using some crushed jet. It's kind of a shiny black stone. I 
Just kind of carefully arrange it in there so that it uh, fills these inlay spaces as completely as possible. Now just to help fill that in a little bit more, going with some red mica powder, which will add a little bit of color into this inlay, as well as fill in the gaps a little bit more. And just flood some thin CA glue over the whole thing, and then sand away the excess using a leveling beam. And you can see once all the excess has been sanded away, fills those spaces pretty completely. Um, if there are any small gaps, I'll go in with more either of the crushed jet to fill that in, or some more of the mica powder, and then float a little more glue over it and sand it flat once again. As you can see, that turned out pretty nicely. So once that's done, I'm going to go and start putting in the side dots. And just sand those smooth to the edge of the fretboard. And then I'll begin putting in the frets. Now, I like doing it this way where um, you put in each end of the fret first and then cut the fret wire. Uh, I, I find this way has the least wasted fret wire throughout the process. Uh, and you can see me running my fingernail along each side of the fret after it's hammered in. I'm just checking to make sure there are no uh, gaps underneath the fret, or between the fret and the fretboard itself. Once those are in, I get to file down the edges so that they're smooth, and put in a slight bevel. And then I come in with this little file and round over the fret ends. So I don't really have a, a, a set pattern for how I round over the fret ends. Mostly I, I work at it for a bit, feel it, work at it a bit, feel it again until it, it feels like it's the way I want it to be. Of course there I check the fretboard with a, um, a notch straight edge to make sure that it's straight. Then mark the tops of all the frets. I uh, used a fret rocker to check if there are any high or low spots and began leveling. Uh, after leveling for a bit, check with the fret rocker again, make sure there are no higher low spots left. And then now coming in to put a little bit of relief into the upper frets. Or, sorry, a little bit of fall away in the upper frets. After the leveling's done, go in with the rounding file and just round the tops of the frets back over. Uh, again, I've marked the tops with some Sharpie and you can see Kind of see there in the camera, it's a little hard to see, but I'm working until there's just a thin line of Sharpie all along the top. After the filing, I'm going to use some sandpaper. I'm going to work progressively up through a couple different grits of sandpaper to get out all of the uh, scratches from the files. And then I'll come in with some uh, polishing bits on the, on the Dremel to polish off those frets. It's now coming back to the volute area of the neck, uh, since I didn't carve that in earlier. Not sure why I left it until now, but I'm doing it now. And for this, I started with the saw rasp and then moved to a half round file to you know, work that in. And of course, sanding it all smooth after I'm done. Now that essentially all of the fretwork is done, I'm going to, I'm ready to glue on the wings. And 
I know some people ask every now and then, why don't you use biscuits or dowels or things like that when you're gluing the body together? You don't really need them. Um, I'm fairly good at clamping these pieces into place where they need to be, and I also leave a bit of excess material so that even if they're slightly off, uh, just removing that excess material will get everything where I want it to be. And of course, wood glue is very strong, so things like biscuits or dowels, adding strength is really not necessary. And I'm just removing the excess off of the end of the neck. And then I'm going to begin uh, shaping the body a bit more. So the body has been, or the wings have been very rough cut up to this point. I'm just going to go over to my spindle sander, this biggest drum, and smooth those out. Uh, it's, it's at this point that if any corrections needed to be made to the shape of the body, this is where I would do it. And now that I know exactly where those wings are meeting the neck, I can carve in this transition from the neck to the body. So after the bulk of the work is done with the angle grinder, I'm going to go in with that half round file and smooth a lot of it out, get it much closer to where I want it to ultimately be, and then sand it again using the small random orbital sander. I'm beginning to uh, hog out the bulk of the material where the pickups are going to go, just using a Forstner bit on my drill press. Of course, drilling some pilot holes for where I want uh, the, the uh, two control knobs and the toggle switch to go. So with bulk of the material out of the way for the pickups, I'm going to finish routing out those cavities with my router. Of course, did the first one with a very nice Stumac routing template, and the second one I'm using with uh, a template that I made myself, and this one I've made specifically to fit right up against a fretboard so that uh, you can get in there. The, right, the Stumac one won't fit up there if a fretboard's already there. Now I'm going in and beginning to work on the control cavity. Now, I'm not routing the full depth of it because I know I'm going to do a pretty significant carve on the front and I don't know exactly what depth I need to route that back cavity to yet. So I only made it part way and now I begin carving the front of the body. And I find this to be a fairly interesting process personally. Um, so I show essentially the whole thing right here, obviously in very time-lapsed fashion. Uh, but just so you can see how I do it, it's it's not just one big hefty carve all the way across. It's a whole lot of small carves working away to where I want it to be. You can see there, I know exactly how deep I want it to be uh, along the edge and also how far up into the body I want it to go. So I've got lines marked out for both of those, so I go to those lines first and then work away material in the middle until the, the uh, carve is what I want it to be. Obviously this being an angle grinder is not a subtle tool. Uh, the carve is quite rough when I finish here, which is why I'm going to come in with my large random orbital sander, which has, I think, 60 grit sandpaper on it here, and uh, get that much smoother, much more even. Now I'm going to begin drilling for the string through. Uh, unfortunately, my drill press couldn't actually reach the last two holes for the string through, so what I ended up doing um, was taking this piece of scrap and drilling a vertical hole through it to essentially guide my drill bit to begin with to make sure it was drilling straight. It didn't quite work like I wanted to, um, 
So my mistake here was drilling all the way through from the front. Now what I should have done was drill halfway through from the front and then halfway through from the back. Um, so it looks fine from the front, all the holes are perfectly aligned, but those last two are just a little bit off on the back. It's not quite as noticeable once the ferrules are in place, um, but it's that's the one thing that I think could have been a bit better on this. And I'm beginning to put a little bit of a carve on the back. Um, put a larger carve up near the horn because it, it just kind of looks weird if it's heavily carved on the front and then not carved at all on the back. Um, and then adding a comfort carve across the, uh, the inner curve. Now that I know exactly what depth I need to make the back cavity, uh, well first off I drilled the holes for the the knobs and the toggle switch to their appropriate width, and then I routed the back cavity the rest of its depth. And then using a smaller Forstner bit, I'm drilling in the access for the jack. Here I'm going back to uh, veneer so I can make a back plate. I know some people get upset when the back plate isn't the exact material as the top of the body or things like that, but like I mentioned earlier, there was just barely enough bog oak to actually make this body in the first place. There was not enough to make a back plate out of it. So the way I made this took two pieces of uh, walnut veneer, since I have tons of it. Uh, I glued those two pieces together with the grain in each piece going in uh, perpendicular directions. Um, that way the back plate won't, uh, well, will be less tempted to warp. And then taking a uh, much more interesting piece of the Pale Moon Ebony veneer, uh, going to glue that onto the outside of the back plate. So that's going to be the visible part. Now it's worth pointing out here the walnut veneer is uh, fairly thick. I think it's about maybe two mil. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but the Pale Moon Ebony veneer is very thin. Uh, it's like a sheet of paper. And of course just finished shaping it on the spindle sander, and now I'm going in and using one of the other small cutoffs from the body, making a press rod cover. Just working the shape on the spindle sander. I'm drilling the hole where I want it to be, and then I'm going to uh, fine tune the shape of it a little bit farther using a leveling beam. So at this point, it's thicker than it needs to be. I thinned it down a little bit, but uh, off camera. And so here we are just finalizing the shape of the back plate to get it to fit in the space that I already routed for it. Nice snug fit. And then drilling holes for the screws that will hold it in place, as well as countersinking them. So now we're just about ready for the staining process. So what I'm going to do is go in with my small random orbital sander and sand every surface of the body and neck up to uh, 320 grit. Uh, with the exception of the fretboard, obviously. Now because I don't want any of the stain to get outside of where I want it, um, the stain wouldn't show up all that much on the bog oak, but it does kind of show up on the wenge if I'm not careful. Uh, you can see there I kind of need to end up sanding some of it off of the wenge so that the wenge didn't look strange. So, first coat of stain, you can see the uh, flame figuring in the maple start to show. Here's the other thing, kind of looking back on this, I, I think I liked how it looked before the stain. 
Yeah, I mean, I like how it looks with the stain, but I also liked how it looked without the stain. It's, just, it's tricky. It's one of those things you don't really know how it's going to turn out until you do it. Uh, but then sanding down the first coat and applying the second coat, and this is where that flame pattern really starts to show. You can especially see it in that middle piece there. And especially on the back here. The back and the neck, really. Yep, there it is. Let's hear him drilling for the ground wire to the bridge. And a path to get the wires from the pickup cavity into the control cavity. And you can see the uh, channel that I had routed into the neck earlier there, kind of in the corner. So I'm going to begin applying some wipe-on polyurethane finish. Uh, this finish always gets some pretty nice results. So what I'm doing with the body here, I'm applying it with some 1200 grit sandpaper. So what this will do is it'll kind of sand some wood off of the body as I'm applying the finish. And those little wood particles are going to soak in with the finish and get into the pores of the grain and sort of act a little bit like a grain fill. Uh, but the added benefit of applying the finish this way is that it dries very, very smooth. There's very little work you need to do after. Like this shot here is just after applying the finish. This is uh, after, I think, the third coat with no additional sanding or buffing or polishing after that coat was applied. Of course, I'm not going to just leave it like that. I am going to buff it a bit smoother. I'm going to begin with some high-cut compound uh, just to take any potential scratches out. Um, because the 1200 grit does leave some small scratch marks even when you apply the finish this way. So this first, this first buffing compound is going to remove those scratches, and then I'm going to follow up with a uh, fine polish compound to really shine it up. Now this here still being the high cut compound. And of course, make sure to wipe off any remaining buffing compound before you move on to the, the finer stuff. So there's the uh, fine polish. And wipe away the excess with damp rag. So there's one piece still remaining. Um, the way I did the carve on the front, uh, normal pickup rings would not have worked because uh, the upper right corner for the neck pickup would have hung over top of the carve. So what I needed to do here was make some sort of oddly shaped pickup rings to get around that. I mean, either that or directly mount the pickups, but I thought this would turn out a little bit more interesting. Uh, since I had this piece of bird's eye maple, it's not really big enough in the necessary dimensions to turn it into a guitar body. Then, personally at this point, I don't think Bird's Eye Maple makes all that interesting of a guitar body. Maybe that's controversial, I don't know. But the figure makes for a nice touch on something like pickup rings. And so what I'm doing here is I'm going to lightly burn those Bird's Eye Maple pickup rings, and that's going to kind of bring out the figure of the wood a little bit. Now, some people have asked before, why why burn them instead of just using black stain? And the reason is that black stain and burning the wood just don't get the same results. Now, especially in this case, because I'm going to be adding some red stain. Now, if I just done black stain and then followed it with red stain, it would the whole thing would have just been, you know, dark red. But by burning it first, there's the separation between the black of the burned parts and the red from the stain that still highlights the figure of the wood. Uh, a lot more effectively than just 
two colors of stain might have. And then of course I applied some of the same finish to the pickup rings as I did with the body, and now I'm going in and applying shielding paint to the control cavity and the pickup cavities, as well as the uh, inside part of the backplate. At this point there's not a whole lot left to go. Um, um, next up I'm working on the nut. This is a black tusk nut, which is the material I generally prefer to work with. It's a nice, very consistent material. Uh, I know some people would prefer I use bone nuts, saying, oh, that's, that's the traditional way, but bone can have inconsistencies in its density that can, can mess with you. So I, I like working with this material because it's a bit more predictable. Of course, once I've got it uh, formed to the appropriate size, I'm going to glue it in using just a few drops of super glue. Then using a pencil that's been cut in half, I'm going to mark out uh, the depth of the fret slots. Eh, not fret slots, string slots. And now that the nut is there, I know exactly where I need to drill to attach the truss rod cover, so I'm going to do that. And here I'm putting in the string ferrules. Um, now some of these holes, the ferrules kind of would fall out if I just stuck them in normally, so I'm applying just a tiny bit of super glue to make sure that they don't fall out whenever somebody changes the strings. There was a few of them didn't quite fit as easily as others, so just giving them a little bit of a tap with a small piece of wood in there to make sure that nothing marks the finish. Now getting ready to install the tuners. Ah, the joys of working out of a garage. Anyway, uh, the holes that I drilled are not quite large enough, and uh, of course some finish from, you know, the finishing process has gotten in there and gunk them up a little bit, so cleaning them out with a reamer to make sure that the tuners fit the way they're supposed to. And drilling the holes and screwing them in. These are some really nice uh, Goto tuners with the 21 to 1 gear ratio. Which is really nice. They tune very accurately and they feel very smooth. I'm beginning to cut the string slots into the nut. Now at this point I'm just roughly cutting them down to the line that I drew. Uh, I'm going to cut them to their final depth uh, once the strings are on the body and I can actually feel how close they are to where they need to be. Now I've had people complain before, you cut the fret slots too deep, the whole guitar is ruined! Keep in mind, you can file down the top of the nut itself afterward if you need to. So here I'm applying some oil to the fretboard. You can see that flame figuring coming back out again. Looks really nice on there. So there, putting in the ground wire to the bridge and attaching the bridge. So this is one of the easiest bridges to install of any bridge I've used, it's just the two screws. And of course drilling for the screws to hold on the pickup rings. And there I got the Fisherman pickups, it's the Tosin Abasi signature pickups. They are quite nice. I also like how they have sort of a matte plastic top as opposed to uh, as the Devon Townsend signatures I used last year, and those had a really shiny black metal top, which is also nice, but I kind of like the matte black a little bit better myself. Just a personal preference. And of course they're installing the rechargeable battery pack. 
Now the wiring was uh, fairly complicated and took a while, so I didn't film all of it. I just filmed this part here where I installed the battery pack itself. So here I'm just going one more wire. Uh, but once the wires are in, I'm going to do a small test. Just to make sure it's wired properly, I put in the jack and you can see uh, if you're looking at the little recharger port, the little red light blinked on when I put the jack in, and that's that's a good sign that lets you know that it is hooked up properly, because that's what it should do. Nice testing, make sure all the wiring's done properly, both pickups coming through, and the selector switch is the right way around, and it's even the right, right, right way around the first time, which uh, is a rarity some, sometimes. Also checking to make sure the push pulls are working the way they should. Now the push pull um, on that second knob there is the one that uh, switches these pickups to single coil mode. For whatever reason, the bridge pickup is so quiet in this mode. I don't know why. I don't know if it's supposed to be that way. Um, I couldn't find anything wrong with the wiring. Um, so unless I got a weird set of pickups where that voice on the bridge pickup just didn't work very well, I don't know. But it, it's extremely quiet in that third voicing. Here, putting on a couple of Q parts knobs. They're a black metal knob with a they call red abalone top. I figured that would match the rest of this body quite nicely, and they do. And like I mentioned earlier, now that the strings are on, I can go in and check the string height up at the nut, and the strings are quite high at this point. Which they usually are initially, so this is why I'll need to come in and file down those string slots a little bit farther. Well, of course, this is a uh, fairly slow process. You need to be careful with it. Make sure you don't cut the slots too shallow. Or sorry, too deep. So I'll file away a bit, put the string back. Check how it feels, still too high, take the string back out, do it again, and then keep going until it's at a height that seems appropriate. And that's entirely by feel on my part. And they're just checking each string against the other strings, all about the right height. And final step, putting in the strap locks. So next up, a small playing demo. Alright, so a couple of quick things before I get to the playing demo. Now, first of all, uh, all the usual YouTube things, like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Uh, I've got a lot of other videos out there, a lot like this one, and several more on the way in the coming months, so be sure to stick around for that. Um, for some social media plugs, I've got an Instagram, it's at Orbital Guitars. Typically upload pictures there as I'm working on builds, so you can get some kind of behind the scenes things, or just pictures of things I'm working on, usually quite a bit in advance of when the actual videos go live. Apart from that, I've also got a Discord server, it's relatively new, so it's still kind of quiet in there. Uh, we, if you're interested in joining that, it's a place where we can discuss things like guitars, building them or playing them, we can talk about music, gear, those sorts of things. If that's something you're interested in, there will be a link to that in the description. And I've also just launched a website, it's orbitalguitars.com, and whenever any of my guitars go up for sale, that's where they'll be. You can find a link to that in the description as well. There's nothing currently available on there as of this video going live, but there will be soon, and it's uh, some of the more interesting guitars that I've uploaded in the last couple of years that are going to start going up there. So um, I'll make an announcement when uh, we're getting close to when those those listings will go live. And last up, I just want to talk a little bit about the control layout of this guitar. Uh, because of course these are Fisherman Fluence pickups. They're the Tosin Abasi signature set. So they've got three voicings. Uh, in With everything in the normal position, it's the active pickup voicing. Uh, if you pull out the volume pot, and you've got the passive voicing. 
and if you pull out the tone pot, then you've got the single coil voicing. So you'll see demonstrations of all three voicings, clean, slight crunch, and high gain. So, now that's out of the way, we get on to the playing demo.